So, Father, as we pray unto you, ask you to lead and guide us, Father. Father, as you right now, God, that we only be after these things, but God, help us to be active in the things that you give us, Father. And Father, we pray for our children, Father, that are in so much need of guidance, Father. Father, we pray God you bless them, God, like never did before, Father. Father, raise them up to be productive and citizens. Raise them up, Father, that will love one another like never did before. And Father, it's right now, God, you bless this session, Father. And Father, as we leave this place, I will leave with a different mentality, Father. Father, we leave encouraged and most are motivated. To do the things that you call us to do. It's in Jesus. I mean, pray, we believe, and we trust. Amen. Thank you, my sister. Can we give a round of applause to the caterers? A, B, C, Catering, L, L, C. Thank you. Was the food good? Yeah. All right. I tell you, that was all right, guys. I got your card. Let me hit you up. And can we give a round of applause to Chapter 3? And we have designated about 30 minutes for each of you to do your presentation. Now, if you start going over, if you hear some music playing, they ain't asking you to dance. <laughs> they ain't asking you to get up, get on up. <laughs> They're asking you to sit down, sit on down. <laughs> so when you hear them play that music, start bringing it on in, bro, and I have about to say, I'm done. <laughs> All right, so to begin this evening, we're going to ask one of the committee members, Ms. Carrie Pierre, if she would come. Right here. She's right here. Do what you do. Hello. <laughs> Y'all <are> fool. <laughs> that was dry. Hello. Hello. Much better. Now, Ms. Joanna asked me to do an icebreaker. Really? <laughs> I think you all have eaten. There's no need to do an icebreaker. I don't think so. I'm looking at you all's face. Okay, stand up for me. Everybody stand up. Keep passing. Look, you can only 
one per person. You can't repeat it. You tell that one person. And you have to tell that person what you heard. The next person what you heard. Okay? And then we can just come back and we can just see. Well, some of you all that want to just pass stuff around. Let's have a little fun. Okay? Three minutes. Three minutes. Okay? Yep. I'm going to start with Brandon. No, 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 no. I'm going to start with my girl. All right, you ready? Thank you, baby. Let's go.
<laughs> okay, let me try something else. Hold on. Left this table. And you came here. This table right here. Somebody tell me what was told you. Just tell me. Just tell me. Tell me told. Students can come and say, My mama said, My dad said, Yeah, grandma said, that. We need to be mindful of what we say and how we say it. That's the meaning of why I chose this exercise. Because words are powerful, words have meaning. So we need to be careful because they can get twisted. Yeah, come on, let's give her a round of applause. We're showing everybody up. Okay. So, yes, we are here to elevate Edgecombe. And um, I'm going to tell you, I went to a workshop in Greensboro. I think it was the partner workshop, NC partner workshop, I believe it was. And my future NC was there, and they did a presentation about the, the, the state of education. And I left there very discouraged. I mean, I, my heart was truly broken about the data that, I, that, that was given. And I came back and I told the mayor, I said, something has to be done to change the trajectory of education. Because I was truly, I, I, I've not worked in the school system for a while, but I work at an alternative school. And I can kind of see some of the breakdown. But I do believe, I honestly believe this, that something can be done about it. People just say that nothing good is going to ever come out of the young people of, the, of today. Yes, it will. People say that the old folk ain't did nothing. Yes, we did. But I believe if we pull together, when you see a challenge, I believe we face it head on. We can make a difference. We can change the trajectory of it. So we are here this evening, and I'm gonna ask Brett, if you will come, Brett Benton. He's with the Education, uh, uh, Edgecombe County Data, make an Edgecombe County Data presentation. He's with NC Future, and he's gonna show us what we look like. 
He's going to show us where we are. And after that, we need to determine where we need to go. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, first off, I love that unintentional setup on the talk. So, you know, we played a game there where it went word to word, person to person, closed off, limited communication. And then all of a sudden, we tested each other to see what we started, right? There's another lesson in there, and that's about expanding who's the audience for what we know. Making sure that we connect the tissue between us to understand each other's walk of life, to understand each other's in a way that informs what we do about it. And great intention is a wonderful thing. But great intention a lot of won't get us there. So um, I am going to present some data for you tonight. I don't know if this is going to tell you who you are. I think y'all know who you are in a lot of ways. And I think that conversation will continue. But what I hope this does is it gives you a little bit of a, uh, a glimpse from the numbers about where things sit and then inspire some thoughts about what we might do about it. So um, as Linda mentioned, I'm Brett Brenton with My Future NC. Um, I am a career educator that came out of seven years in high school, a few years in middle school, and uh, school administration, elementary school, in multiple counties across the East Coast. Um, I ran my own educational nonprofit for the Research Triangle Park. I was focused on diversifying the STEM fields. Uh, and then I had an interesting, I think this is good for kids, like sometimes you feel like, to hear this, sometimes you feel like you're on a clean path, and all of a sudden, something comes at you, and you just gotta be ready to either Grab it, run with it, or ignore it all together and wonder for the rest of your life if that was something you should have paid attention to. Um, I had a chance to go work for a national nonprofit that was doing work to help black and brown businesses become more successful. Cities all across the country, three dozen cities. Now, as a former educator, that didn't make much sense in terms of how I got there, but I found myself gravitating towards it. And that taught me so much about what we call ecosystem practice. You go into your neighborhood every day, there's people who connect to each other, who like each other, who don't like each other, who break bread with each other, who never have a conversation with each other. That's the ecosystem, healthy or unhealthy. You look at the way that the schools, at the community college level, at the public school level, the charters, all connect with each other, all play off each other. That's either a healthy or an unhealthy and what we need to do is apply that practice all the way down to every kid who has an aspiration to do something with their life that the community around them can help with. So that ecosystem practice brought me to my future at see where I got to blend the ed education piece with the ecosystem piece in a way that, as Linda said, hopefully illuminates some ideas. Um, <clears throat> the goal of my future at sea is really encapsulated in one thing. By the year 2030, this state, as prosperous as it is, as rich an opportunity as it is, is going to have a chance uh, for 2 million people, ages 25 to 44, to have a, what I'll call a family wage job. A job that if I was the only one that had it, I could support my family on it. And that's really what we're all about. I mean, how do we break a cycle of uh, wealth that has been denied to so many people across the state? for so many reasons. We empower them as individuals to be able to take advantage of their own path forward. So, in a way, it's looking at that early phase of life. We've kind of grown up, right? At 25, we're grown, whether we like it or not. And we need to be starting to embrace our path forward. That can be done, if you go back 30 years, everybody said you gotta go get that four year degree. You gotta go to college, you gotta go to college. That can be done today in so many different ways. And so what we're trying to do is embrace, communicate, and lift up the paths to these family wage jobs that simply just didn't exist even 10 years ago. So when we start to think about how big of a gap this really is, if we just sit back and let things go as they are and do what we've done, then we're gonna be over 400,000 people short of this. And it's a really good measuring stick because these 25 to 44 year olds, Linda pointed out her generation, 
right? She pointed out the kids. 18 years old. That's right. Recent graduate of high school. Congratulations. It's a big time. Yes. Um, but there's this, there's this generation in between, and they really keep the engine going in a lot of ways. And how strong they are is how strong a local economy and community are. So that's why we focus on that number of 400,000 short and opportunity abound. I mean, we've never lived coming out of this pandemic in a time when there are so many chances for quality uh, career opportunities. So what does this look like for Edge? Well, first off, you know, you're in a state that's probably doing as good as any state in this country. Uh, yeah, that's true if you live in Mecklenburg County and Wake County, but it's also true if you live in Bernsey County and in Robinson County and counties all across the state. Opportunity is here. We are considered to be, if not the best, in most measures, the most uh, promising state for business opportunity, which means jobs um, in the country. However, like I was saying, these are new types of jobs. It's, it's not going to be your traditional, I got to get that four year degree. They're short term paths. The short term paths that Edge Computer College is offering and are probably underfilled that could put somebody in one of these family wage jobs as soon as six months from now. So these certifications, these credentials, these ways to keep a pipeline from leaking itself to death are the kind of things that we focus on. Now I bring this one up because I think it's really important. You think of a 14 year old going into high school, freshman, 14, 15 years old. Um, I have a daughter that's gonna do this in three months. 15 years old, she's gonna go into high school. And you fast forward 10 years, the 100 that entered, out of those, only 28 of them, six years removed from their graduation, their anticipated graduation, will have what they need to have one of those family wage jobs. 28 out of 100. So opportunity, again, it's work that keeps coming up. 72 individuals that we lose along the way. Are we gonna, is everybody gonna go to get a certificate? No. No, but 28 out of 100, I mean, that's just begging for us to give it attention. Begging us. So, when you take a look at Edge Coast specifically, you know, I want you to see it along these four lines. What does it look like when we try to get kids ready? I just had a great meeting uh, with Henry with that, uh, Downey's partnership. Never deal with them, but really focus on this pre K thing that she's a master of the first eight years of the child's life. That's what we're talking about, academic readiness. What does it take to be ready to be successful? Are, you, are your kids in pre-K? Is the parent who has that child allowed the kind of um, flexibility they need to work on themselves while their child is also being raised? Looking at when we move into middle school, are, are they being exposed to careers? Do they even know? Can't be what you can't see. So do they know what's out there? What's, what opportunities exist? Can they imagine themselves in them? even if there's nobody that lives next door that's doing that job. Post-secondary completion is a big one. You're gonna see it for, um, for Edgecombe County in the data. Um, how do we make sure that we keep these students who are at that pivotal point that I talked about, that 15, and they, they got the whole world in front of them, from staying on a path that gets them to do something they can really feel passionate about, but also that their, their local economy, they're just, local industry needs, and then labor market alignment. That's making sure that piece is linked up. So what we've done, and I'll have a number of copies of this that y'all can come see um, over on the tables uh, by the entrance. Uh, so we put together a two-page profile, and it really speaks to all of these different levels and how Edgecombe County is doing. It compares you to peer counties. So you're not being compared to necessarily a Johnston County or a New Hanover County, you're being compared to counties that um, are in a very similar situation in terms of the number of people that live here, um, the type of community it is, rural versus urban. And then we can take a look at how are you really doing? How are you doing when I take a, look, a close look at um, things like college and career readiness in math and reading? These third grade, fourth grade reading scores, eighth grade reading scores. How are you doing when it comes to completing a degree uh, in good time so that you can move into one of these family wage jobs? And this, this is a, a taste of it, but this is how you're doing. So in Edgecombe County, one of every three kids, more than one of, 
very three kids, um, grows up in poverty. Already, already coming into an educational environment with strikes against them, with supports that are going to be needed. And at the same time, not even uh, three out of four are living in a house that has access to broadband, which is going to be essential for anybody to be successful, not only in the job itself, but in getting the path to the job. Um, this data is important. It tells us about what kind of families um, are, what, what families are able to do to support their kids as they're entering these phases, these critical phases of life. Looking at the 100, 100% breakdown, if one out of two stops their path at that high school diploma or less, and one out of two have, have exceeded it. Even the ones that 14%, that dark gray, that's such an important group. They've gone to college, they've tasted it. They went to a class or two in education, they did not carry through. They don't have that degree, that credential. They can open doors to them. So when you look at that, that's 64% of, of these um, individuals, age 25 to 44, that have not gotten themselves where they need to be to be successful. So when you see the 28%, it starts to make a lot of sense. And it starts to make a lot of sense about the fact that we can gear programs towards these kids to get them where they need to be, these young adults, to get them where they need to be. And it's a never too late piece, too. <clears throat> How does EDGECO compare against the state? Pretty well in some cases. Um, you know, if you look at black population, if you look at the low income population, performing almost on par with the state. How are they doing in some other areas? Across uh, female, Hispanic, non-low income students, the gap is huge. What can be done? Now why? why? Why is all this important? Because if we want to think about an intervention, if you, if you go to the doctor, first thing he's going to say, all right, what's wrong? Well, I've got this pain in my neck. OK, well, we don't know if it's a muscle or a nerve, or what, what it could be, right? You've got to keep digging, keep digging. That's data, that's important. This is that pain in the neck that we can focus on and start to develop strategies around. So, the last one is the one that I'm, coming out of education, you don't think about this group very much. But once you get into a position like this, this is all I can think about. Opportunity, this is a term that's been assigned 16 to 24 year olds, either gender, who are not currently in school and are not currently employed. In Exclone County, that's one out of six. One out of six, 16, 24 year olds. One out of six young adults. Male or female. It's about even. You'd be surprised. It gets higher with females in that 20 to 24 range. Line up the six. One of them will not be working and will not be in school. Now, what kind of path? And I, I don't think about it for a Let's think about that individual. Where is life going to take? Where are they going to end up? And then what kind of impact is that going to have on the children? County? How are they making this county a better place? How are they making themselves a better place? So again, I show you all this data, and Linda, you were right. It's, it's hard data, right? It's not, it's not fun stuff to see. But there's great work happening. Um, you've got community colleges rolled up sleeves on this. Um, I think a lot of people are, are familiar with some of these organizations, but whether it's on the workforce development side, public schools. Um, I had a, a great opportunity to, uh, to to get to know uh, the, the head of Turning Point Williams the other day in a meeting. Um, and like I started this, people are out there and they're taking their lane in this. What we need to do is create the connectivity between them so that they can understand how they can do it better. All right, the last one I want to point out, because this is work that we already have that we can example of what it looks like. Faino Step, Faino the Work Here Initiative, the Local Education Payment Collaborative, uh, that, that runs through Step. That's a program that's run for the last two years as part of this NC Impact My Future NC Partnership. It's one of 15 across the state that are doing the same thing. We're starting to learn from each other. 
And we're going to start to inform what it can look like. So generationally, we've asked ourselves, what can we do differently, right? We've tried a lot of things. Now it's more of an all hands on deck. And the reason why it's so important for y'all to do this is because there is a place at the table for every single person that wants to, to, to impact these outcomes. There's seven organizations right there that are working together. So it's already happening. But I guarantee you this, it is not going to get to where it needs to be unless we get everybody on board. So hopefully this might be a little bit um, not too somber, but it sets the stage for the reality of the situation and, and what we can do about it. You'll be hearing uh, a lot more uh, from my future NC in the, few, in the months to come. Um, and I look forward to seeing it's going to become the best version of itself. Thank you. And the last one, 
It was during our radio loud. The loudspeaker came on and we were notified that we were going into a lockdown. We practiced this, we know what to do. But why did anyone tell me we were having a drill today? The kids did exactly what we practiced. They are staying calm and quiet. I'm proud of them, but this is not a drill. I'm the only protection they have. 25 lives are now my responsibility. There was not a class. So now you will hear from some of the great teachers of Edgecombe County. We have a few questions. Um, I do have questions that we prepared, but you, you can feel free to ask any questions. If you want to ask a question, you just raise your hand. I bring you the microphone. You can stand and ask your question, um, and you can decide which questions you want to ask. Fair enough? Right. If there is a question that you have before I start, you may raise your hand, and I'll let someone else start. If not, I will start. Right. So my first question is, what brings you joy in your classroom? And I'll just... Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I really can use my teacher voice, but I'll I'll be able to use the microphone. Um, what brings me joy? Um, is the results that I see within my students. Um, I did not enter into this career field to get rich or wealthy. Um, I entered into this career field to make a difference. And that is what brings me joy. Um, I work with high school students, so of course, seeing them after the fact come back and tell me some of the great things that they're doing, that brings me joy. Um, helping a student to fill out an application, because um, I teach career and technical education courses. Uh, hearing from a student that um, struggled with me to let me know that they're doing well, that brings me joy. Uh, working with a beginning teacher, um, coaching and mentoring them, and hearing them say, uh, Ms. Jones, I appreciate what you tried to do for me. Um, I, I got it now. Even if they do leave afterwards, which does happen, um, they know and they let me know that I was I was making an impact in their lives. So that's that's what brings me joy. I can definitely echo what Ms. Jones said. Um, for the like, past two years, I got the opportunity to teach Hill Rap. And it's amazing watching your scholars go from writing characters to stringing letters to putting those letters and making words and then reading the words and the joy they get and then seeing their parents so excited because they're hearing them read and they're like, oh my God, I got it. Um, it it's, it's a feeling that you don't get. And every day is not perfect and yes, there are some struggles, but when they get excited, they know they got the concept, that really brings you joy. For me, it's, it's, it's showing growth from the beginning to the From the beginning of the year to the, to the end of the year, the, the difference they, they show, it just, it just makes a difference. Not for just for them, for yourself too. So next, anyone else have a question before? I don't need a mic, I'm good. If I can be heard, no problem. Perfect. I've been where y'all are at in certain situations. I've been in public service all my life. I just left the school system not too long ago. I do have this question, because the only way we're going to elevate, it's nice to hear the joys and everything and what goes on. The only way we're going to elevate is to figure out what the problem is. I'm asking each of you, we don't do this, we don't do public service for the salary. Salaries we can't control, nobody's going to be able to control, we can just ask for that. What's the one obstacle as educators, the biggest obstacle that you face that makes you go home at night and think, I'm not coming back tomorrow? What's the biggest obstacle? Two, three, four. Yeah. 
I know there's board members here, but they're going to want to hear it too. They want to know what the obstacles are. If they don't hear it, it's never going to change. So entering into my seventh year of teaching, I, I've worked at several other um, organizations before, and I love teaching. I really do. Um, I did not think I would, but I do. The moments that I have contemplating leaving education, um, most of those were brought about because of the extra responsibilities that are placed on teachers. Um, not the regular duties that we are assigned to do, but it is the extra things that's placed on us that uh, could have been done by someone else in many situations should have been done by someone else. Um, that is, uh, that those are the moments where I contemplate leaving education. Other moments that I contemplate leaving education is um, it would have to be the parental support or at times the challenges that come with that. Um, Hey, I'm a parent, I get it. My children are grown now, but I, I was a young parent at some point. I know everyone's busy, but after contacting a parent with my concerns about their child who is struggling and, and not doing well, and um, hearing, okay, I'll talk to them. Um, or even not hearing that, uh, Sometimes that that really gets me on you know pretty low because here I'm pouring out and pouring in to their child just as much as I can, but when I reach out for that support, um, it's not always reciprocated. So it's for me it's the extra duties that could have or should have been handled by someone else, and at times the challenges between the parental support. And again, I am at the high school level, so that, that makes it a little more challenging. I can also echo that too. Um, I mean, this is my seventh year. I just finished it up. Um, I originally came from a bigger district. I just finished um, grad school. And comparing resources, kind of makes you think like, oh, this is crazy, I'm not coming back. When you hear, and I know we're not supposed to do that, and I get that, but you always hear like, you know, another district has access to that, and you want to be able to provide it to your scholars, and you can't, that's very frustrating, because you're like, it's gonna make your life easier, and it's gonna make their life easier, but you don't have it. Um, Parents will support it. I, I got the honor to be on a team to do parent, caregiver, educator academy this year. And the work that went into it was so amazing. And we had amazing parents that showed up. But it's always like, can we get some more parents in there? Because I've been, you know, I've been cussed out by parents, you know, they're mad, they send you the emails, they send you the notes, they go to the office on you. And you're just like, if you had just showed up to this one event where you can sit down and we can give you the strategies, we can give you, um, we can co-parent, because that's what it is, right? It's a co-parent relationship. You know, teachers reaching out to parents, you know, we can see that you read the dojo message, like you can see that we read your dojo message. It goes both ways, and it does get frustrating. Um, but no one teaches for money or fame or anything, like, I believe all teachers that come to school want to be there. I truly believe it. Um, and it's the support, like it's that extra support. I'm um, the only special education teacher in my school and it gets lonely sometimes. Like there's some, like no one to talk to um, about certain things, like when you're trying to brainstorm. And I'm just so grateful for the other teachers in the building and they'll come in and they'll be like, all right, let's brainstorm together. Let, let's see if we can problem solve. Um, I used to work with Ms. Jones' daughter and we did so much collaborating at one point and it's just that feeling because I believe teachers truly, truly, truly want to work with parents 
And it's only so much that we can do, and I know it's only so much you guys can do, because you guys are working 24-7, um, but it's kind of like you just wish that you get that phone call of like, look, I can't make that meeting, um, what are the other options? I second that, um, especially when you make that phone call, you don't get that phone call or, uh, wait, 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 return that phone call, you send texts, send emails and you just don't get a phone call that it's that support system coming from the parents. But then um uh, then when you do get that get that phone call back and then you get an hour rate parent and then you, you just try to calm it down and just and just get it you go. That's that's what makes you want to like oh you want to give up but just come back and just come back the next day just try to do So I think you've answered some of them. One of them was how important they don't want family for in your classroom. You know, I think we've all kind of spoke on family, how important family is in the classroom. Yeah, you have additional questions? Can you microphone? Oh, yeah. Okay. My question is, what resources are there in place for that to be put in place to make your job easier? <laughs> <laughs> so at the high school level, um, we could always use parent support by way of coming in, talking with teacher conferences. Sometimes that stuff slows down as the child ages up. Um, but we still need y'all, we, we really do. Um, you know, and in reference to like material resources, of course, our CTE department is um, pretty well off with resources. However, I want to speak up on behalf of our art um, teachers and our music teachers. Our art teachers operate sometimes off of a hundred dollar budget for the year. I don't know if you guys have purchased any art supplies lately, but a hundred dollars for uh, 60 students, sometimes 90, that's not going to go very far. Uh, music teachers, uh, parents have to um, shelter the, the burden of purchasing those equipment, those materials. Um, if you're talking about trying to expose children to the outside, you know, field trips or bringing in guest speakers, um, of course, all of that is a huge challenge on the um, budget that, that we all operate out of. Um, this year, field trips have been an issue with drivers. Can you explain what CTE is? Absolutely. CTE is Career and Technical Education courses. Um, and so our, a lot of our funding come out of federal money, so it's a little different in reference to what the public school regular teachers have. So our budget is a little different. Um, not saying that we're wealthy or well off, but our budget is a little different because we operate out of a different um, pot of money. And we support the post-secondary, so after the students graduate, we're trying to get them into the workforce and expose them to careers. So it looks a little bit different. Um, but again, uh, some of your core teachers, your art teachers, your history teachers, your music teachers, if you ever run across, you know, additional resources, they could really use um, donations and support. One of the things that one of my parents did for me for a field trip, um, the parent, his company paid for my students to eat lunch off campus. That was a huge um, donation or resource that was allotted to, to my classroom. Um, that caused my parents not to have to pay for that meal. And I don't know if you guys have had bad lunches from school lately, but that caused my students to not have to have a bad lunch from school, right? I'm going to go back and go back. I sure I certainly didn't mean to. Um, 
But so so any anything that you know you run across that you're able to uh, assist with, uh, we we would definitely welcome it. And I'm sorry for taking the time, but if you have like a specialty area or a some a background that's of specialty, ask. Can, to, can you come into the classroom? You know, if you have a, a talent or something you can showcase, we love to hear from you. Um, reach out to your child's school. See if they have time for you to come out to do something or or, or anything like that. Um, that that would be what what I would suggest. Um, I can't pinpoint one thing. Once again, I work in a, a department that's not exactly funded from the school, it's kind of coming from the district, but uh, come to parent night. Uh, teachers are there because we want to have the conversations with you guys. Um, it's kind of hard to have a conversation if you're not there to collaborate. That is one thing that is really important for us. Um, for instance, we had math night at my school a couple of months ago, and out of the whole school, seven parents showed up. And we're, here, we're feeding dinner because uh, we want you there. We want to have that conversation. We want you guys to join PT. I think it's a PTO. Um, it's a um, we want you there. We want you in the building. We want you to vocalize what is wrong, um, what can be improved. Um, parents have voice matters in the school. It, you do not want only teachers and administration making decisions. Like, when we have the fun things, you guys show up, and we're so happy that you do, and I don't want anyone thinking, like, well, we come to this, but we want you there for, like, the, the hard conversations as well. Um, we want you to take the lead on some of those events. Like, parents talking to parents. Um, I know working on the North Side, everybody is related, so I know if one person comes out, everyone's going to come out. I do agree that all. Um Donation because um, during my during my my class my final is um, a certification so also a field trip so we have to go away for the um, final exam for a certification and a lot of had a lot of parents donate a lot of um, snacks. And stuff. Thank you so much for your time and for your input for your questions. If you have any additional questions, um, you can see me afterwards and just let someone on the planet for me know. We will definitely make sure we get with them, get with other teachers, and get um, your answer, um, your question answered. <laughs> Thank you so much.
first three digits. Everybody first three digits. First thing. Okay. Last three. Y'all say the first three digits. So, everybody first three, one, nine, three, correct? Yes.
what we possibly all we possibly can to make sure our children get exactly what they deserve and even more. As a 26 year educator, I don't see that. Um, I've seen a lot of great things, but I've seen a lot of things that we need a lot of work on. For example, right now, as a principal at a high school, we have to beg students to do their work, even seniors, in order to graduate. They're right here at the edge and you miss the class, you skip the class, and you call your parents in, you talk to you, try to find out what we need to do to motivate you to do better. Even an excellent basketball player, his dream is to be on in the NBA, and he could be, but he has a GPA of 1.4. Can do, but just refuse to do. So elected officials, we have seen the data from my future NC. We've heard from our teachers of the year for this year. And the question that I have for the teachers of the year is, how can we recruit and retain more teachers like you? How do we recruit and retain more teachers like you? We have so many vacancies in the educational system, not only in the Edgecombe County, but statewide. We can't even find substitute teachers. And we find substitute teachers that we put in the uh, core classes and they stay all year long because we can't find an education. Our children deserve better. So this is what we're talking about. How do we make, them, make it better? So from the data that we've seen, what can we do as an elected official to make Edgecombe County better? Who wants to start? Well, I appreciate you, Bobby, uh, the meetings that we've had at your town hall and inviting me. I, I sure do appreciate it. I know there are a lot of folks involved in something like this, but my hat's off to you in particular for being a job for it, so thank you. Partly a product of the Edgecombe County Public School System myself. My girlfriend is a third grade teacher, former head of board. She just turned in her keys this morning and is going to Northeast Prep next year. Over the course of this past year, I've heard all sorts of stories. I've heard uh, she got slammed into a door, uh, that, that report got deleted out of the system. It got brought back after some food was raised. But I've heard uh, AC being out, it was 80 degrees in the classroom in three days, uh, even though it was pretty great. Uh, you know, there are a lot of areas that we come up short. Uh, the most telling was kids not having toilet paper at their school. And that was a recurring problem. Now, from the town of Tarboro side, I, I really like to expand what we do after school. Every kid goes home to something different. But if we can come together and figure out what kids need after school, programs like the Boys and Girls Club that I was once part of, uh, when I was at Princeton Montessori, we sat there in the little auditorium. It was great. You know, perhaps I, I didn't necessarily need it, but it was there. Now it's at stocks and it's a, a fraction of what it used to be. Stuff like that. That needs to be brought to the forefront, not on the afterburn. We need to make sure that our kids, when they leave, they have something stable, they have something constructive. And right now, and I, I'll take the responsibility for it myself, we don't have that. And we need it. Um, and then, I guess, lastly, you know, well, I'm kind of blank now. <laughs> and lastly, <laughs> most importantly, one of the things that I have been very disappointed about is the fact that teachers have to spend their own money for supplies in the classroom. That hurt my heart. Teachers' salary is one of the lowest paid salaries. And they're the ones that teach everything that we know. 
And then they have to turn around and use that low salary that they get to buy products and buy paper and buy things for that classroom, toilet tissue, um, clinics, clean the kids' nose. They have to use their own personal money to do that. I think that is something that we can we can talk about. It. Let's let's go to the people that caused that to happen, and let's say something about it. They may not want to say anything because they know this is my job. And if I talk about it, I might stand a chance of losing it. But then we know it. Let's say something about it. I'm glad you said that. I, I'm glad I heard all of that from both of you. Because if we don't know, then we certainly cannot do anything about it. Uh, the economics of the region that you are in has a lot to do with your resources and what you're doing with them. We don't have what the Mecklenburg people have, but I assure you that we, I'm not sure that, I've, I've never heard it, I have a couple of board members here. I'm not sure that I've ever heard that anybody had uh, a big need as, as, as I've just heard that uh, we couldn't feel. There are plenty of toilet paper in this system. And, and, and each, person with this past year, last two years, uh, when we've had the escrow money, we pumped an additional, uh, a lot of funds into the system that uh, could certainly take care of a lot of those things that you all just had that uh, we've provided extra bonuses, we provided extra funds, we've used that money for our teachers, we, we've given them extra allotments to do things with that. It may be at your local school, but we need to know about it. Because those things have been, uh, we, those funds are there. Uh, we do need to know about it. And I, I'm glad I heard that so that I could report back to the person who can certainly do something about that. I'm, I'm appalled that that, uh, that that word is even out there. But what can we do to help uh, uh, alleviate the problems that, that we just heard from the teachers of the year and our panelists? I think one of the things is that uh, we can certainly approach our county commissioners who, who fund, who have the, uh, they have the responsibility of funding schools. That's, that's a state responsibility, that's a responsibility that they have. I know that there are only enough, a lot of so many resources to go around but they have the responsibility. We present our needs to them. We don't, and I hate to say this, but it doesn't, you know, we're not responsible for where you can't get it from. We're responsible for them funding schools. And so what we do is present our budgets to them and, and they do, uh, hopefully, I think some, well, most of the time, the best that they can do. And then recruit, uh, I saw Mr. Tolson come in, recruit these, uh, businesses and manufacturers come, who, who can come in and increase the tax base and increase the, the funding for the schools. And I know uh, there are lots of entities that pull off the tax base that we have. But when we recruit these uh, 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 businesses and manufacturers and other people to come in, the tax base, rate they, they rise. And then we'll get a bigger piece of the pie. But I'm glad that I heard that, what I did here, so we'll look into that. But uh, and it's appalling. I'm, 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 I'm hoping that that's really not true. I'm hoping that's an exception and not the rule uh, that we'll take care of. That we'll look into it. But resources have an awful lot to do with what we have and what we use. <laughs> I'm sorry, I heard you about that. I didn't introduce myself earlier when I. When I ask the question, a lot of you know me, some of you may not. My name is Al Braxton. I'm on the town council. I worked 27 and a half years at the police department here in Tarbur. And one of the things I think I can do and the mayor can do in our town council is provide safety in the school system. I just left the school system two months ago. I was working as their safety officer. I was coordinating safety plans. And I think me and, me and Mr. Privet have had this discussion I think one of the things that also needs to happen, and I brought it to his attention, and I, I brought it to his attention just a while ago, and we can, do, all of us can do this as citizens, parents, and everybody. I'm not, I'm not trying to put them down or look 
unfairly upon certain people in positions. But it hurts me to come to something to elevate the school system and I can't count a single person from central office in this, in this room. Mm -hmm. And when I was policing, and just like now, as far as being a town council person, I live and breathe talk. I came here in 1989. I'm from Kitt County, and I love talk. And one of the things we need to do is we need to approach our boards, approach your commissioners, approach your council, and get them also to talk to central office in the different places. Dr. McLeod, everything that goes on with schools, with ECC, I see him everywhere. He is here. He is, I mean, he's always on top of it. And I applaud him. <laughs> when you're put in these positions, it's not an eight to five, Monday through Friday, take a day off here and there when you want it. It's 24-7, 365 days a year. I tell people, if you've ever had one of my cards or had my phone number, you can call me at 2 o'clock in the morning. And if anybody wants to try it, you can call me at night, 2 o'clock in the morning. I'm going to get up and answer my phone. Because I'm going to see what's happening. If your number will come up and it's not a spam number, I will answer the phone and ask you what you need. And that's the only way we're going to elevate Edgecombe is everybody has got to look at it. It's not an eight to five job. Parents, it's not a it's not a seven, it's not a seven to three thirty babysitting at the schools and then when they come home you let them do what they want to do. Raising these kids for 24 7, 365 days a year job. You can't let the school raise them and you not do anything and vice versa. The school shouldn't require you to do the complete raising to and educate. It's got to be shared. And we all need to get this word out. And I understand that, you know, we want to come and we want to elevate and we want to say the positive things. But the way you elevate, you've got to reveal the negatives. If you don't reveal the negatives, you will never elevate the system. You've got to tell what the negatives are. Because I can say all oh, the positive, there are positive things. Mr. Privet. He is dedicated to this school system. He could have left it alone. How many years ago, Mr. Privet? 20 something years ago. Yeah, I mean, he could have left it alone many, many years ago. And here it is. He's still dedicating his life to it. And he still goes around and walks into schools to see what is happening. We all have to do this. And as board members, council members, and everything, we've got to spread that word and get everybody to do it, including our businesses. Thank you. And I should have done this earlier. I did my superintendent contact me. I was on my way here. She had an emergency in Raw. She's a grandson that she has to look out for, look after because of the death of a parent and I hate to say the inactivity of the other parent. But she uh, said that she had to go to Raw to take care of that. And that's the only reason she's not. I salute two of my board members who are here. Johnson and Worthy, Worcester. I salute them, but you're right. Everybody should be here. But I, I needed to let you know, while Super Superintendent is not here, it's an emergency. She would have been here and wanted to. Is there a question from the audience? Gets in trouble. 
I'm trying as a, as an administrator to put them back on the right track. So I called Mama to tell her what's going on, and Mama starts cursing, and she curses me from ten o'clock to ten thirty. I cross my legs and I listen, and when she finishes. I said, thank you very much, ma'am. Have a great day. <laughs> but come get the child. <laughs> I say that in a, in a kidding way, but it's, it's true. These are the realities that we're dealing with. So now, the next well, question. Well, I, yes. I pick it back on something that you just said. I did serve the educational system for 40 years. I taught 10 years. I served as a principal for 30. I've been through four different decades of education. We're, what we're dealing with are the signs of the time. When I started, I was an assistant principal, English teacher, elevated as an assistant principal at Northwest Halifax High School. We had 1,300 kids, one-third white, one-third black, and one-third Indian. I, I, we used to have, uh, and I served as an athletic director, football, basketball, and track coach. We, we had Pimp writers, and I tell the teachers, just go to the lounge. I got it. I wouldn't dare do that, man. <laughs> what we're dealing with a sign of the time, it's, it, it, people ask, me, what's the difference? It's home training. Mm -hmm. It's home. It's lack of parenting. Yes. I parent, and I can't talk about you because you're here. But our parents, for the most part, want to be friends instead of parent. They have to parent kids. Uh, you have to, it, it's a sign of the time. Schools are catch basins. Other, other auxiliaries and, 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 and things get it off. We don't get it off, but they have to come to school. We have to deal with what we get. Uh, I know that we're not perfect. I know that there are, there are problems, not just here, but all over. But if you look at the, the, the United States of America, all of the school systems, like let's just take the 115 in North Carolina. You take security officers out of there and everybody will probably walk out of there. These are signs of the time. I don't know that we ever had uh, as much uh, violence and as much, they see, they're traumatized by violence. They see violence. They, they practice violence. They do that. So, yeah, we're sorry that, that, uh, that security officers are there, but uh, these are simple signs of the time. And, and we're catch faces. We just, we take We'll never come. We have to do that. One, one quick thing, and I'll, I'll feed you back on what he just said. To let y'all know how it is going at the schools, having been there, the reason I just left the school system, and I left it for a very important reason, my wife told me to. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason why she told me to is that I, I did. I spent all those years in retired as a police officer. And I had weapons pointed at me. I had weapons pulled on me. I had to fight many a person that was drunk, high on drugs, whatever. But when I'm in the school and several kids run to us and I'm standing there with the resource officer, and understand this now, I don't have a vest on, I don't have a badge, I'm retired. I don't do that anymore. But they say there's a kid chasing another kid and he's got a knife in the library. Me and the resource officer run there. And like I said, resource officers sometimes get a bad rap. They do. But they're there to protect. We run down there. He grabs the student with the knife. When he grabs the student with the knife, another student grabs the knife from him. Well, okay, he's got his hands full. Who do you think grabs the student with the knife? I grabbed a student with the knife. We get both of them headed towards the office, and another fight in the same location breaks out with two more. And these and these young men are just as big as I am. The resource officer had to take the other two. I run into the library of teachers, and I don't I don't expect them to. They're not going to jump in the middle of that. I get in the middle of it, and I end up covered from here down with a student's blood where his head was busted open, and I'm trying to separate him and separate two, two kids who are my size fighting. I had to send that picture to my wife because it wasn't going to be long with everything, with everybody communicating. 
My daughter was going to see it. It was going to go to my wife. I let my wife know that. It was time to go home. And until we do start discipline at home and support the schools when they discipline and not curse the administrators and curse the teachers for disciplining, it's not going to change. It's going to get worse before it gets better. But that's how dangerous it can be and how important safety is in our schools. Well, out to that point, you know, discipline is a huge problem in our school system. It is. It is. You know, when a uh, principal comes and gets a student, that student goes to the principal's office, comes back 30 minutes later with, with a lollipop, and not a slap on the wrist. One, that child disrupts class, stops the teacher from doing their job, stops every other student in that class from learning. And then when he comes back with that lollipop, are you really discouraging that behavior? Before my brother speaks, these are now don't get don't get these are these are exceptions are not the rule now. You, these things don't happen every day in every school now. Please know that. These are you had a lot of good days. Had a lot of good days. Uh, a lot of good days. These are exceptions and not the rule, man. I, I'm not a bad. <laughs> really. I, I think we focus on the negative a lot. And, and I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it. But but Brett told us about focusing and all of everybody. You, you can't just one incident out of a billion. I know that incident to that person is 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 traumatic. It's traumatic. It's traumatizing. But these, I'll show you. These, I am out there on the front line every day. These are exceptions and not the rule. Mark, but I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Premier. And I think that that segue kind of to what, where I'm coming from, from a mindset of someone who comes from a background of therapy. I'm always focused on the solution. And as public servants, you get into public service because you want to be a part of what the solutions. And so for me, as I sit and I always listen, and everybody's first thing is the parents, the parents, the parents. If we're being honest, we've been, you know, we're being honest about where we are, which region that we're in, where did the, start, the trauma start, right? There's patterns of trauma. So as servant, as servant leaders, um, and knowing that your teachers are a catch basin for all of these things that happen, Society. right? Yeah. Uh, are there in, innovative ways and ideas to one, A, meet parents where they are, because those parents are also going through their own trauma and sometimes can't even show up for themselves Absolutely. and we're demanding that they show up for their child, yeah, absolutely. right? Part two is what are we innovatively doing as leaders, right? Because we know real work does not happen at a town hall meeting, real work does not happen at a board meeting. What are we doing to again go out into the community or work with folks who are going out into the community to again go back to meeting the parents where they are Right? and meeting the children and the youth where they are so that we're focusing on a growth mindset. I'm just freshly back in Edgecombe County. And when I left here, I said I was never coming back. Because I've never been a person of fixed mindset, but when I come back here, that's what I'm surrounded by. Is when I say fixed mindset, is we're folding into what we are versus focusing on what we can become and we always focus on the exception and not the rule. So what about the other 95% of kids who are doing great that don't have these opportunities who will be part of that two million? Those are the kids who are gonna reach, help us reach our two million, but so many times, just like we talk about politics, right? What happened to the middle class? We're getting washed away and they're getting dragged right into everything else. And it's not fair to those students either. And so yes, we have to talk about those things, but we have to talk about the root of how we got where we are. We were talking about back in the day, poverty wasn't as high as it was then either, was it? So we have to, poverty is a cycle of trauma in itself. And so we have to start to talk about those things. And that's why I love ROI and the things that they came into our community and done with Self and Vici. And like, how can we get more of that? How can we talk more about the rule? How can we talk more about the future? And we're always talking about the negative. Yes, we have to talk about it. But if that's all our kids hear, that's all our parents hear, then where's the hope? Hope is stagnation. Right? Without hope, we're stagnant. This place is called a bucket for a reason. Right? It's time to flip that bucket upside down. Like you said, it's time to elevate. So that's pretty much all. Thank you. Anything, Megan? Anything, Megan?
How much time do we have? Five minutes. Five minutes. Yes. Got another question. One of the things we need to think about, so often we just take a look at this room right now. There are generations divided. We talk our own language, but we don't work together in talking. And when we see a problem, we have to, we have to address that problem. So many people give the school system such bad names. But remember, the first teachers are the parents. And yes, like she said, how do we get their, how do we get their ear? And I've been an administrator too. And it's really tough sometimes because, you know, basically now, they've got to go to buy nails, they've got to go buy shoes, they got to go two jobs, three jobs, and somebody, somebody got to pay, boo whatever. And one thing we got to do is generations. We talk differently, but we say the same thing. So I would say part of our problem is, I'm 76, she's younger than I am. <laughs> but when, we, but when, we, when we talk, if we talk and use our ears, guess what we're saying? The same thing. The very same thing. But our problem is, we talk, but we don't always listen. listen. My husband deceased, but one of the things he taught me to run a school was, let your ears do the talking, and it'll give your mouth the right thing to say, and you'll never have to say you're sorry. And I think that's what happens so often. We spend so much time talking. Everybody got, everybody got, everybody got, yeah, 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 yeah. And everybody can find out who this, who this, who. And what we need to do is just stop. And it's going to start with small groups at a time. But we really, really, really have to really face the fact. Children come to the schoolhouse door. What they are is what they have been. You are who you are based on where you come from when. Yeah. We've got to take that and really, 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 really <laughs> mean it. We've got to work together. You can't run away from the problem. I mean, we miss it. I mean, yeah, our children need to do what we want them to do, but it should be tough in our schools as well. But we cannot use any one particular place to say, this is what you say in that, you say in that. We all have a problem, and the problem is, how do we elevate our children to have a future of tomorrow? And I would just say is we need to start talking in our generational talks. We're not talking, saying, saying things different. We just need to listen to each other because at the end of the day, if we sit down and listen to each other, each one of us is saying the very same thing. We just say it differently. You know, I, I wonder sometimes, I, I asked the question, I said, I wish that my mom or, my, or even my grandmother sometimes with a round seal. And, and I want to ask them, were you as afraid for me and things that I did, things that I said? Uh, did you ever think, girl, you ain't going to make it? <laughs> you ain't going to make it? Because sometimes generation does carry a difference. And we, we may say be saying the same thing sometimes in a different language, with different words. I, I, I wonder if our parents, well, I, I, those, those was that, what, what they really, if they could come back today and say, you know what, I didn't think you were going to make it either. Yeah, that's right. So, we may be afraid for our youth right now, but I just refuse to believe that they're lost. I just refuse to believe that they are not going to turn at some point. Because I know there were some things that I had to turn from. And I ain't gonna tell it to nobody tonight, you know. Take that to my grave. But I believe that if we could just get to the point that we would start believing in our kids and then showing them. And then, guys, you gotta remember too, parents are a little bit younger. Maybe I'm just old enough. But it seems to me that parents are a little bit younger than they were in our time. So I think sometimes when we just lay down our, uh, uh, you know, like we, so, it's so easy for us to say, well, you know, back in my day, we didn't do it. Mom and them wouldn't have that. They would not. But there were some things that they didn't even know about. So if we could just try to focus and see what can we really do. And if we all pull together, I declare that I think that's the, that's, that's the key. If we could pull together, just like we're here this evening, I'm hoping that we are bonding in a way that we never have before. But if we can just, 
Everybody don't have to have the right answer. But listen to somebody and then compare notes. And then let's see, can we change some things or grow some things? Um, but we know we still have to take care of the child. So how can we as elected officials, how can elected officials connect with business partners and connect them to the school systems to increase the pipeline to sustainable employment? And how can we work on increasing social engagement for those that are within that 25 to 44 uh, year age range? So that way we don't have to commute or it's not, or we're not saying that I only live here, I only work here, or I only play here. So how can we do all of that together? That way we still have that age group 25 to 44 that have their kids and we want to stay in the area, but we also want to get involved because we know that our school system and our elected officials are working together to create pipelines for our kids to be able to stay in this area. That is being done right now. Yeah. It's going to kind of public schools yeah. and what's the other? Yeah. Yeah. That is exactly what they're doing right now. Right. You want to speak to that? Good evening, everybody. Thank you. Um, I'll leave it pretty long. Okay, so um, my name is Brandy Murray, and I work with SVIP, which is Strategic Twin Counties Education Partnership. So we focus on work here. It was actually up there earlier. Um, so we pretty much focus on the cradle to career pipeline. So my work in particular is around literacy and building the culture of literacy. So y'all will see that going into August and the culture of literacy is a holistic approach, which means that we are assessing everyone in the community. We are looking at small business owners. We are, we've already had partnerships with um, larger corporations. We're working with both of the community colleges. We are working with elected officials, school systems, neighborhood association captains and everything to figure out what everyone can bring because all of that is going to be really important in creating a very safe and engaging learning environment. So for example, if anybody crochets, you still have value towards the children in your neighborhood community because if you really want a, a neighborhood worth living in, for lack of a better word, then you have to invest in the people there to see the value in it and to want to sow a seed into it. So let's say there's somebody in the room and they crochet. And it's like, well, you know what? I, I really don't think I can go into a classroom with 25 kids or, you know, what? them high schoolers down the street that tear my nerves up. But there is a six-year-old that lives next door that would love to learn a skill set. So after that after-school program that was spoken about earlier, that's when the community will come in. And that's the work that I do, figuring out what are the skill sets because then we may not have to focus on, oh, we need to get a bus and we need to find additional funding so that we can bus them 20 minutes out the way to maybe another county or somewhere where it's going to be very difficult for the parent to do, even to the point where when we talk about meeting the parents where they are. So going into the fall, I'll be going to places like Cummins and Barnhill, and I'll be coming there with food during your lunch break, and I will be giving you the information so that if you are a second shift parent or you're a third shift parent that you still aren't missing the information. So the work is being built as far as, you know, making sure to bring it to you where you are. I do have part of anyone wants to talk to me after this, but the work is is being done and we really want to bring in as many community voices as possible to make sure that we're not trying to speak on your behalf, but you live here and want you to invest in your community. And if you've already been doing the work, you had 10 play cousins that you just adopted, then we definitely want you on the team. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Give me 30 seconds. I don't, I don't want us to go away with a negative taste in our mouth. Most parents, not all of them, but most of our parents are doing the best that they can. I, I believe that. I honestly believe that. I wish 100% of them were. I guess that's why I got a job in the church preaching. But most of our parents are doing the best that they can. They're struggling. There are some kids who meet their mama 
going, getting on the bus when they're coming from their second job. These people are struggling. They, they, most of them are doing the best that they can. I, I tell principals all the time, people want to help and want to volunteer. They just don't want to, they don't know what to do. Help them. When I was principal in Princeville, Linda was one of them. I was first principal in Princeville, and she worked for me, under me. She worked with me. My teachers used to complain about kids not doing their homework. At Patilla, uh, Princeville, Patilla, Martin, our principal of eight schools in the system. I said, if they don't do their homework, stop giving it to them. I said, let me take you where these kids live. I took my parent, kid teachers at Martin to some of the places that they live. You heard the music three blocks before you got there. If you live here, would you do your homework? If nobody told you to do it and helped you to do it, when I was principal in Princeville, I got up. We had a superb PTO. They gave me some money to set up an after-school homework helper program. Kids didn't do the homework at home, do it at school. We paid teachers to help them. Most of them are doing the best that they can. Don't, don't believe that they're not. Some are not. And let's, for those who are not, let's be that village that we used to be in help. Again, everything in this home county is not bad. We have some great things going on in this home county. I remember when these three gentlemen were born. <laughs> and look at them now. And look how old I am. I remember when this young lady was born. And look at her now. I remember when that young lady was born. Look at her now. I don't remember when you were born, Carl. <laughs> Let's thank the elected official again. My wife left and she took over for me, so uh, when the task is once begun, never leave it till it's done, so I'm here. I'd like to present to you our keynote speaker, Dr. Robert Taylor. Dr. Taylor is a friend of a friend and a colleague of a colleague of mine. Derek Jordan is my friend and my colleague who turned me and introduced me to Dr. Taylor. Uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Derek Jordan would have been here, but he teaches. Uh, he's a he teaches at Carolina part time. He works at BPI and all of that stuff. But anyway, he says I'm going to let you send you to a young young man who's going to fill in and do it as well as I do. He's a native of Mississippi, but in North Carolina he's taken his rounds. He worked in Cumberland County and then went to Sampson County as an assistant superintendent. He served ten years or more as the superintendent, illustrious superintendent of Bladen County, Elizabeth Town. He worked for the Department of Public Instruction. He went back to Mississippi, now he's back with us. I'm not gonna take any more time. He can introduce himself, Dr. Robert Taylor. And so I think, uh, I, I, I hope the fan doesn't pay me up anymore. <laughs> uh, I, I'll, I'll give you an abbreviated message because I know we're getting close to the end of the hour, but uh, I want to tell you, it is certainly my privilege to be here and talk with you all and, uh, and be a part of the Elevated Education. I uh, heard some wonderful conversations tonight, uh, and I think it certainly uh, gives you the roadmap to where you need to go. Uh, Brad, that was a wonderful presentation in terms of uh, the future in NC, my future NC. So it gives you a snapshot uh, of what the demographics are right here, what your numbers are. And you certainly need to know that because if you plan to go anywhere, you need to know where you are first. Uh, so I think that was wonderful. And let's thank Brett again for the wonderful information. I want to say a couple of things before uh, I kind of get into my presentation. And first of all, this is to the parents that uh, it is absolutely important that you continue uh, to do the work with your children. Uh, and what I want to say to the parents here is that engage with parents that are not here. Because if you are here, 
Uh, you understand the importance of being in this forum, what it does for your children. Uh, and so engage with those other parents that are not here. Engage with their children. No one understands how very important it may be when you go to the beach to take your children and you ask your neighbor, can they go out and go to the beach with us? Because that's an experience that you may not have. Uh, and so it's important that we don't forget about our neighbor. And I want to say to the students in the room as well, because many of you are here. For the students, uh, if you have technology in your hand, raise it up for you. Grown folk too, right? raise your technology. And so this is the warning that I want to give you, that technology can be very good, it can be very bad. Absolutely. Exactly. And so the choice is up to you both as parents and as students, how you use that technology. Mm -hmm. Remember and understand, there are these things called algorithms. Mm -hmm. And so that means when you look at TikTok and Instagram and Facebook, there is a reason why the Los Angeles Rams keep coming up. Because I'm a Rams fan, I look at it all the time, and the algorithm plan for that. So remember that parents and students, make sure that you use that technology for the purpose that you design. Make sure that you know and understand what they're using, uh, how they access technology, all of those things, so that you can be in more control of that. Uh, than the technology and the algorithm. That is very important. It's a powerful tool. Uh, it puts you in touch with so many, much information that you didn't have before. So I think that's wonderful. Uh, I do want to say that uh, children are the same. Mm -hmm. that's right. Parents are the same. <laughs> uh, we certainly believe that things are different because uh, I tell my mom how very different my children are. Uh, and she said, well, Robert, you were very different. And her mom told her she was very different. My mom was born in, in 1939, so she was a child of the 60s. So you can imagine what that was like. But she turned out fine. Uh, and so I want to say to parents that your most important job is to invest in your children from the time that they are born before they even get to public school. That is your responsibility. Uh, and I can tell you from a personal experience that I'm so glad that my mom made that investment in me and my three brothers. You see, I come from a single parent home uh, where we all have different fathers. And so we were the four boys that they counted out. And so my oldest brother is a minister, Minister Michael Taylor. Uh, my second oldest brother is the first Dr. Gregory Taylor. He's the first Dr. Taylor. I'm actually the second. My third oldest brother, who was uh, they wanted to put him in a special education program. My mom refused to allow that to happen. He did graduate with technical skills, and he later went to Mississippi State, graduated with a degree in electrical engineer, and he just retired in December from the National Security Agency. I have no idea what he does. Robert Taylor got the kid. Wow. And then there's the, the baby boy, uh, Robert, Dr. Taylor. So I had the opportunity to serve from a teacher all the way to the state superintendent of Mississippi. And so we were those four boys that they counted out, but it was because of the investment that our mom made in us, well, we turned that where we are. So that's what I want to say to the parents in the room. It is really about how you invest in your children and how you all continue to invest in each other as a community. Uh, that is what I like about what I hear tonight, because you know and understand the things that are necessary to move you forward as a community. And so uh, I want to focus really on, on four things uh, because this is what it's about. Uh, elevated edu edgecom from an educational perspective. Is that what we're talking about? Uh, it is about what can we do educationally to, uh, to elevate our, our community, our schools, our children. So the first thing I would tell you is that regardless of what you do in the community, Make sure that there is a continuous focus on instruction in schools. So why is instruction, the focus on instruction important? Because that is how children learn to access and process information based on the instruction that they get in school. Who's going to be teaching them? Who's going to be understanding that they know this curriculum? And so that absolutely starts with the administrator and the teacher. And so I say that you want to make sure that the principal that leads your school is an instructional leader. 
And so when you say instructional leader, what do you mean by that? That means that that person has a keen focus on teaching and learning and how he or she develops teachers within that building. They have to know instruction. And so we expect also, uh, all principals to be managers because budgets have to run on time, schedules have to be done, lunches have to be cooked and delivered and, and eaten by students. All those things have to happen in, in order for a school to function. But that is not the primary purpose. It really is about teaching and learning and making sure that the principal understands what instructional leadership is and how he or she grows teachers. The second portion that I'll say to you, it is about teachers and how they become better at what they do. And so uh, as parents, you heard from teachers tonight, uh, they want to see you. They want to hear from you. I will tell you that uh, a parent who shows up and talks about their child, we call them the squeaky wheel, right? They will get the order. Right? Because teachers have only so many resources, only so much time, it's finite. But if that parent who continually asks, why did Johnny get an F on this paper? Now, we know Johnny didn't do his homework, Johnny didn't do this, did that, he didn't study. But if a parent asks you, then as a teacher, you're going to say, well, you know, i got to do something more with Johnny because mom is here, dad is here, they're asking. But we want to make sure that our teachers grow as instruction, instructors in classrooms. I know what I was as a beginning teacher, and I certainly hope I was not the same many years after that. And so there are things that we know about how kids learn, uh, how they learn to read. And so you're going to hear these things about the science of reading. And so that's very important. What that says is that the brain learns to, to read in a particular way. And we have to make sure that in our early grades, teachers know and understand the science of reading so that children can access curriculum, knowledge, and information. Because if you can't read and interpret and understand, then you're going to miss out on a lot. And so we do have to make sure that there is a keen focus on instruction, and it does not happen only in the school. It happens at home. Mr. Uh, Reverend Pripp talked about coming through the neighborhood and hearing the music before you got there. So that means as parents, you have to make sure that your home is an educational setting that invites learning. So you don't have to sit down and do the algebra with your child because you may not know how to do it, but you can say from 4.30 to 6.30, the television will not be on, the radio will not be on, you will not be on the computer playing games unless you're doing home. See, you can do that. You can pick up a book and slip page by page and take your time and turn and turn and turn and can't read the word. But what does your child see? They see you turn the page. See, the reason I like to read it is because I watched my grandmother from the day I was born read the newspaper every hour. We like mom is what we call it. And so it's about how you set an educational environment in your home. That is your responsibility. So it really is about focusing on instruction. Make sure we do that. The other thing is that we have to continue to focus on resources as a community. That is the second thing. Meaning that we have to know and understand what we are providing as a county. I did not say what the county commissioners are providing, but what we are providing as a county. So that means know and understand what is the minimum effort that is required by your county commissioners. And are they doing that? Also understand what your community debt is. Because if county commissioners decide we're going to pass a bond for $90 million to raise this money and we're going to community says, yeah, we're behind it, we need this money, but, but the LGC will come along and say, sorry, you all can't do that. Too much debt. Local government commission. But, but what do you mean? This is extra we decided, no, you have too much debt and we will not allow you to take that on. So you have to know and understand what is it that we're doing as a county as it relates to resources. But also, as a school system, we want to talk with our community. We want to talk with our commissioners about the return on investment. Yeah. Meaning that when you give us dollars,
Before we ask you for a single penny more, we want to talk to you about how we use that money, what the return on investment was, and why we need you to give us more money. Because understand that every investment that you make in your school system is an investment in your community's future. Because businesses want to know and be reassured that when you graduate and come into the community as a business person, you have a skill set that you can use that's going to help them prosper as a business. Because what are businesses in the business of doing? Making money. Making money. Tell you they have to buy But that's what I want to know. Am I going to buy a car? I said, you sell the car to get a profit. I understand that. We just have to make sure we agree that the profit, the, the profit is appropriate. So that's what businesses are. But businesses also make investments in your community. So no one understands uh, what your debt service is like, and no one understands what resources you need in your community for your school. And so I do want to applaud the young lady in the mental health services because she talked about the trauma that children experience. It is very important that we understand these things exist and we have to mitigate those problems as a community because you are going to get resources from Raleigh, from DPI, to hire professionals, but you have to supplement that by what you have at the local level. If you have a greater need because of mental health issues, then we have to make a greater investment. Kids don't show up to school and act food simply because they want to. That's right. Sometimes it's our control. Things that they've witnessed, things that they've seen. Uh, and so it's up to us to help mitigate those things. So we all know what it's like to be young and insecure and looking for help. But understand that in 1985 when I graduated high school, there was no such thing as the internet and social media and blah, blah, blah. And so think about how social media impacts children. They see things, they hear things, things posted about themselves. That's very different than how I grew up. And so luckily I was able to grow and mature and turn into a confident person. But what about when I was not confident? And the internet is there beating me up. That makes me That's why we see these issues and these problems. So it's, it's about how we understand what resources we have in our community and how we want to use those resources. That is very important. Uh, the next thing I want you to focus on, and I'll end with this, is that let's make sure that we have a focus and concerted effort on children before they ever get to public school. And that is about making an investment in pre-K education. And so that means that you have NC pre-K slots here. You have Title I slots that you have access to. You have exceptional children slots. And so make sure that we're looking at uh, how many slots we have, and if those slots are filled, that we have a robust child find activity to put those children into those, uh, those pre-K classes. But I will also say to you as parents, and what you can say to your neighbor, is that you've got to make those investments before your children reach that age. Remember, we're talking about pre-K that's four years old. There's a lot happens to children before they turn four years old. And so it is about how we make investments in our children before they come to school, how we encourage our neighbors to make investments in their children. 60 voice privacy contents have been updated. That technology So that's what we got to remember is just how do we impact children before they get to school and how they value education. So as a parent, Make sure you read to your children. Make sure if you have infants that you put the magnetic letters that you can get from the Dollar Tree from Dollar Twenty Five on the refrigerator. And you don't know much about education, but if the child asks you, oh, maybe that's the letter A. That's the number of one or two or three. So there are things that we can do to invest in our children before they ever come. And so remember, there is a distinct difference between a child hearing 400,000 words at the age of four versus 78,000 words. There is a huge difference. When you see parents that may not be parenting correctly, don't turn and move. Engage. I'll give you an example. How many times have you gone to the grocery store? 
And the child asked, Mommy, Dad, what's that? And what's the response? Don't you put your hand on your yeah, hand. No. That is a teachable moment for you. Baby, that's a kiwi. Well, Mommy, what does a kiwi taste like? Well, baby, I'm not sure I've never had it. Let's buy one, take it home, and try it out. See, children are naturally inquisitive. So it's up to us to make sure we take advantage of that before they ever get to school. And I will ask to say that focus on student outcomes. Go back and look at the data that Brett talked about. And if our kids are graduating, let's have conversations with them after they graduate. What are you doing? What is it that we could have done better? What kind of job do you have? Did we have the right type of CTE programs? And for those of you who don't know, Career and technical education is what we call vocational ed. Yeah. Well, I'm getting out of there. Right now. <laughs> I was hoping somebody would say that. I know the regular Brittany has been. I mean, I'm getting 30 in education, I have 31. <laughs> so uh, make sure that we focus on post educational outcomes and understand what it is that our children are doing when they're leaving, what is it that we provided or did not provide. And so what I wanted to do is to talk about all the resources that the Department of Public Instruction has available for a district in all of those areas that I talked about, whether it's uh, resources, whether it's instruction, whether it's uh, outcomes of children, or whether it's pre-K education. The Department of Public Instruction has resources and people that can come to Edson County to help you and assist you in that process. Remember, you pay for it. Mm -hmm. You pay for it, so don't hesitate to ask for it and make sure that they come here and be a part of the work that they do. I want to applaud this community for what I've heard tonight. Don't let this be the last time that you engage. Understand that the people that need to hear this message and to be involved in that message and be a part of pushing this message forward are both in this room and outside this room. So it is about how we engage with each other. And so anytime that I can be of assistance, uh, let me know you have a native son, Dr. Derek Jordan, and he loves that he does, he does. And he will always come back to us. And he is a deputy state superintendent, so yes, he we got the answer to that. Right. So again, thank you for the opportunity to talk with you. Uh, certainly continue to engage as a community. Uh, our senior people in the room, you have so much knowledge and experience. Don't be afraid to share that. Young folk, you don't know it all. Young folk, I'm tell you, don't know anything. Because I remember when I was 17, I thought my mom and grandma were crazy. I didn't know. By the time I was 21, I believed it more than they did. So no one understands that a person does not get 83 by being a fool. They have knowledge and they have wisdom. So young people, Young people in the room, my young Anybody here who's under 15, stand up. Under 15, I'm going to get 15 and older. Now, baby girl, I know you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Young people, engage with your grandparents, or engage with an elderly person next to you. Talk to them about life and what you can learn from them because you may be surprised they may be able to beat you at Matt as well on that next box. But there's so much more that they can share with you. And so let's make sure that we keep our communities connected in this way, that we share the knowledge and the wisdom that we have. I tell you that the smartest person that I ever knew was my grandmother. Though she tell you she was absolutely brilliant. And luckily I knew that from the time. So thank you all. Again, I'm here for the Chief Senate Dr. Brewer. Outstanding information. Outstanding information. We just take it to heart, do something with it, and let's give away some more money. Yes. All right. All right. All right.
digits are six, nine, seven.
They need the soft skills. Getting up in the morning, getting to work on time. Knowing how to greet people with soft skills. Then we have the stars. Miss Jack will be back with us. Tanisha Lewis, women's basketball coach at East. And this was in the state. It was all the way to the state, then. Yes. And they won the CIAA tournament this year. Yes. And then we have Dr. Kia Allen, Chancellor of Western Governors University out of Ohio, the Edgecombe County product. Came through the Edgecombe County Public School System. So these are the things we're talking about. You see a lot of negatives going on, but there's a lot of positive things that we can talk about with Edgecombe County. And then we have lunch and entertainment. We have um, the clock system that we're singing for. We have Dance team, it's going to perform for us, then we have the spoken word. And we'll have Bass Family Food Truck, and feed us tasty food and delicious desserts. Come out and celebrate with us on tomorrow. It's 9 o'clock to start. 9 o'clock a.m. with breakfast. Okay? Questions before we leave? Tell somebody. Tell somebody to tell somebody. Dr. Taylor, thank you so much. Inspiring story. They said you couldn't, but all your mama, your dad, grandmama produced four superstars. Mississippi. Deep right. South. <laughs> and of course, thank the band. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is chapter one, two, and three. <laughs> chapter three band. We thank y'all the next official, Mayor Pro Tim, from Tom Burrow, Blake Stanley, you. Taylor's already left. Thursday, Mayor Tom Burrow. Uh, Dr. Will, Dr. Justin, please stand. I'm going to tell a story about this right quick. I used to work with her husband at Carolina Telephone. I got fired from Carolina Telephone. Yeah, I got fired. And nobody would give me a job. I was out of work for 18 months. That was Mr. Neal, though. And then her husband told me to call oh, my wife at Phillips back to school. She had an opening. So I called her, interviewed her business position. She did. She uh, interviewed me, offered me a position. I accept the position, I walk in, I quit my other job. She said, the average teacher just quit when you take that job. <laughs> out, of, out of work, I had to take the job, and I'm so glad I did. So thankful I did. That was 26 years ago. And here I stand today uh, in my God-given gift to be an educator. That's not my, that was not my dream, but that was my gift. And I made a positive impact on our children. That building that positive relationship with children. The most important thing for a teacher to understand about children is that the positive relationship. I don't care how much you know. I don't care how good you can teach. If you don't have a positive relationship with that child, you're not going to reach it. I have six feet, seven basketball players, rough and tough around the edges. But to get them in the office, close the door, they break down my face. Because they don't have that positive relationship on the outside. So that's why it's important for all of us all to build those positive relationships with each other. They can be and they will be without support. Thanks so very much. Let's have a great evening.